Good afternoon, I'm Kevin Fox. We're going to be covering building delivery pipelines with Jenkins Pipeline as Code. I wanted to thank you all for uh, coming out for this presentation. This is the second time that I've done pretty much the same presentation in the Ohio Union. Every time I've been in the hardest room in the place to find and I've always been very glad that there were people who made the trek to find that room and come to the session. A little bit of uh, information about myself. I'm the Enterprise Architecture Practice Lead for ICC. If you haven't heard of ICC, we're the largest privately held uh, IT consulting company in the Midwest. We were in uh, 2016 voted one of the best places to work in Columbus. Contact information is there, so if you end up having any questions uh, following the session, feel re free to reach out to me and I'll be glad to respond to you. Speaking of questions, I'm not going to hold time at the end for questions, so if we cover something you have a question on, just ask as we go, and we'll try to address everything as we're moving along. I have a question for you, though. How many of you have actually worked with Jenkins already? Somewhat, you're at least, most of you at least familiar with Jenkins and what it looks like and what it does and all that kind of cool stuff, I assume. Well, before we jump into talking about Jenkins, I do have a little piece of truth and advertising to uh, deal with. I know this is a Python conference. However, there's really nothing in this, this presentation that's about Python at all. It is more generically about software development and so easily could be applied to Python, but as my Python knowledge is about this big, I really didn't feel comfortable trying to work that into the presentation and say something really stupid that showed my lack of knowledge. So I'm going to leave it to you to kind of you know, visualize if you want to apply this to Python use cases. I'll kind of leave that to you or if you have questions after the conference and you know, I can help out with a little bit of research that I did, I'll be glad to provide you any feedback that I've got. All right, so what is Jenkins? Now, most of you or a number of you said that you've actually seen or used it, but I do want to hit kind of out a particular aspect of Jenkins and what it is. It used to be, uh, for all intents and purposes, a build server. But what it has become more recently is more of an automation server. And what difference does that make? Well, if we think about the way that we used to use build servers, it was generally along the lines of something like this, where either because somebody committed some code or because, hey, we had a schedule kinging off once a day, once a week, whatever. We ran the build, we maybe did a few automated tests in there, and at the end we spit out some kind of a notification to let people know what the result was. And that was about the extent of what we expected Jenkins or any other build server to do. But things have changed. Most of you, I'm assuming, are probably living in something more of a DevOps type world now than what you used to. And so we really expect that any time we commit code, there's at least the potential that code could make itself all the way out to production. And we expect our delivery or deployment pipelines to address all kinds of issues along the way. Uh, you know, we do see that we have here the idea that we have our build and unit tests still going on, but by the same token, we now expect to be able to, you know, coordinate with our provisioner or deployer, whatever it may be, to deploy code out to various environments in a somewhat automated fashion. We expect to be able to run functional tests in an automated fashion. We expect to be able to do push button deployments and testing in other environments, even for those things where we don't go fully automated. So there is a much bigger kind of a, a, an ecosystem in which we're dealing than Jenkins used to have to deal with as a build server. And as far as Jenkins is concerned, it's expecting to fill that role of being the orchestrator that manages, it, manages the entire process for us. So that being the case, we expect that Jenkins is going to have to do things a little differently than what it used to do. So what exactly makes the difference? Well, in the Jenkins 1 world, we did things a certain way. Now that Jenkins 2 is out, a few things have changed. I do want to highlight some areas where things have and haven't changed. In particular, let's say from an extensibility perspective. Well, Jenkins 1 always had a very robust plug-in architecture. 
meaning you could extend the functionality of Jenkins to do pretty much anything you wanted to do. And if you go out and look, you'll find a boatload of plugins out there that worked on Jenkins 1, still work on Jenkins 2. That was a very effective approach, and Jenkins 2 carries that over. From a scalability perspective, Jenkins 1 already had the ability to run builds on multiple nodes, so you potentially have a single master, multiple other nodes that are part of the process. You could scale your builds as far as you wanted to scale them. That was good. It's carried over into Jenkins 2. But if I wanted to be able to define a workflow that things would go through as I you know, went, pushed code through that pipeline that we were just looking at, well, Jenkins 1 had the ability to have build definitions that, you know, how, what the build definition could be would vary depending on which plugins you had there. Uh, you could do things like pre and post steps or post actions, and it was never really clear what the difference between a post step and a post action was. You could clone workspaces so that you could share them between, say, multiple builds that got chained together. There's a lot you could do, but it was very kludgy. And it was never, there was never a single way to solve a particular problem when it came to defining your workflows. So as a result, this is the one part that did not carry over from Jenkins 1 to Jenkins 2, and it was replaced with the whole concept of pipeline as code. Now, what do we mean by pipeline as code? Well, from a pipeline perspective, it's that deployment pipeline we were just looking at. Jenkins is going to be the automation server, the orchestrator in that pipeline. We expect it to be able to participate in that. And code, well, just exactly what we would expect. We need to be able to define what happens in that pipeline in terms of code that gets written. So let's pull that apart a little bit and understand the implications of that. From a pipeline perspective, the key thing that Jenkins 2 has done is to find a standard way to look at the workflows that we define for those deployment pipelines. We have a whole pipeline abstraction where we can deal with things like the execution environment. Where does the build run? We want to have some control over that. We want to break the workflow up into a series of stages, so it's not just one big glob of stuff. We want to be able to define the steps in those stages. We want to have some level flow over all of that so that we can make sure that we deal with the conditions that exist and all that kind of good stuff. But beyond just the pipeline abstraction itself, we have things like source control abstraction. As we saw, one of the key things that triggered a deployment pipeline is the idea that code gets committed into source control. All kinds of different sources out there, and Jenkins needed to came up with SCM abstracting that in action as we go through some of our examples. And that being what Jenkins did, it does. And then a visualization, and you see very simple visualization there of being able to show, a, you know. options to fit with their view of the world, but for right now, that's what you have. 
Now, having selected GitHub, first thing it's going to ask me is, okay, what GitHub organization are you dealing with? And I tell it. The next thing it's going to want to know is, do I want to create a single pipeline? Or would I like to maybe scan the entire organization looking for every repository that could be used or could house a pipeline definition? For the sake of this example, I'm going with a single new pipeline. And once I've done that, I tell it what the repository is. So I've got a simple Hello World application out there sitting in a Hello repository of PyOhio Jenkins. I pick that. That's what it's going to use. Yes, go ahead. In general, the expectation, sorry, the question was, if you have uh, multiple repositories, each with their own Jenkins file, uh, would um, Jenkins consider those a single pipeline or, or would those be uh, separate pipelines? The expectation is primarily that those are separate pipelines. Now, having said that, you know, going back and using the standard uh, Jenkins UI, you could probably get the other to work. But that's not really what the expectation is. And as we'll see in a moment here, there are some things that if we do it the way Jenkins wants to do it, it will do some heavy lifting for us under the covers. And so you'll probably lose that benefit if you try to kind of work around their standard way of doing things. Um, and we may look at some things that would help to kind of alleviate that as we get a little further into the presentation. So that what you may find is that's not really necessary once we look at some of the things Jenkins is willing to provide you when you let it have its way. Any other questions before we continue on this? Now, one of the implications of that question I haven't touched on yet, which is, okay, this is all great, but I really didn't tell Jenkins anything yet about what actually has to happen, right? So the expectation is somebody somewhere has got to tell it what to do, and that is my pipeline script. That pipeline script is going to exist, well, sorry, just to prove to you that we actually did create something. Okay, there we see that we've got you know, our, our pipeline for PyOhio Jenkins hello. But going back to the idea of the script, okay, I've somewhere got to have that script, and the most likely place to have it, from Jenkins' point of view, is out in source control. And so, Here's my PyOhio Jenkins hello repository, and you'll notice that I have a file down there named Jenkins file. And that is the standard file name that Jenkins is expecting to find. You can go change that, but again, if you do, you're probably not going to be able to use Blue Ocean. You're not, you know, you've got to kind of go around behind the scenes to configure that. So for the most part, stick with the idea of using a file named Jenkins file in the root of your repository. Now, what do we really expect to have in that pipeline script? Well, this is you know very simple, basic, hello world kind of thing. But out of it, we ought to see some key stuff. Like, for instance, that pipeline block, that is the outermost block of the whole thing, defines this as declarative pipeline. You know, remember we mentioned there was both scripted and declarative. Jenkins knows this is declarative because I put the pipeline block in there. Otherwise, I have a lot more control over what the overall structure of my script is. One of the uh, first um, things I find in there is where I define where exactly this build is going to run. Now, me being lazy, I basically say, well, run it anywhere you want to, which is what agent any means. And in a lot of cases, that may be fine. Uh, you can do things like saying, hey, I want to run this on a, a node with a specific label, all kinds of options there. We'll even see a more complex option a little later in one of our examples where you've got a lot more control over the environment in which the script runs. The next thing I have is a block that defines essentially the work that I expect to happen within my script. It's the stages block. And as you might expect, a block named stages will have a series of blocks called stage, right? These are essentially the big chunks of work or comprehensive units of work, if you will, that I expect to have in my pipeline. Think of them as the top level steps. Within that, within each 
stage, I have a block called steps, and of course in there I have the individual steps that I expect to carry out. This being a very brain-dead, simple kind of a script, all it's going to do is say, hello world. Yes, question. Right. So the question was, can you define your own stages, or is there like a predefined set that Jenkins expects? And the answer is you can define whatever you want, right? It, Exactly, yes. They will run in this order. Now, there are some things that you can do to control um, ordering and so on, and we'll, we'll look at some of that a little later on, or if not so much ordering, at least whether or not a stage executes. If I am in a uh, scripted pipeline instead of declarative, I have a lot more control. I can do things in parallel. There's all, all kinds of cool stuff I can do. And not to say you can't do that in declarative, it's just a little more limited. Um, but yes, I, Mike's. My stages can be whatever I want them to be. But if you think about what I tend to do in a build, okay, I may have you know, a part of it that does the actual build, a part that, say, does unit tests. Maybe I'm doing some kind of code analysis going on. I may do that. I may produce documentation. I may run functional tests, whatever it is. Each of those is likely to be its own stage, right? So that when I, I look at the result of the build, I'm able to see the success or failure of each stage and tell what's going on, right? So it comes back to normal, good coding principles of what things I combine to, together right, to be able to you know, have a, a well-written program here. Okay, so I have this script, and once it runs, I'm going to see a result in you know, in the blue ocean UI showing me what's going on. So for instance, up here, I see this is the result for a specific run of my pipeline. One of the things that we'll deal with a little later if we have time, but that's, that ends up being a really cool feature that Jenkins provides you, is the fact that I'm actually, this pipeline applies to a specific branch in my source control, and it's telling me which branch this is. We'll see later why that matters. Um, I also have a visual representation of the stages I went through. Now, if I think about my script, I only had one stage. The fact that it's green is good. If it were red, it would mean it had failed. If it were yellow, it would mean it was unstable, all those normal kinds of things, right? If I had a more complex workflow, I would see all the different stages lined out there and showing me what's going on. And then finally, I have down here, I think I have down here, let's see, there we go, all the different steps within the stage that I happen to have selected at the moment. And I can even see the log messages related to those specific steps right here. So I click on a step, it'll expand down, show me all the log messages. I don't have to go hunting through the entire log to find out, okay, what happened on that step in that stage. It's all right there. Now, that doesn't mean that that shows me everything that's in the log. There are actually some things that you may want to go elsewhere in Jenkins to see what's going on, but this gives you a good portion of it. And in fact, if I look under the surface, I go look at the actual console output, I'll see some cool things that are happening that didn't really get shown to me too much there in the Blue Ocean UI. So first of all, I see things like, well, I actually went to source control first to get the pipeline script and pull it out of GitHub because when I defined the pipeline, I told it this was in GitHub, it was this organization, this repository, it knows its name Jenkins file, it can go grab that on its own. Now notice it does that before it pulls down any of the rest of the code. I'm not getting my entire code base, which if I've got a large application, that's a good thing, right? I'm getting the script first. Once I do that, I'm, a build workspace will be allocated on a node to run the entire build, the entire pipeline, right? Now what what node that was on was controlled by my agent directive that I put at the top of my uh, script. Once it's uh, allocated the build workspace, it's going to go ahead and pull out the application code out of source control, and then I'm going to execute my step, and you can see hello world and all that kind of cool stuff. And lo and behold, uh, yeah, hey, my first Jenkins pipeline build was a success. Woohoo! All right, so. Let's take a little closer look at some of the interesting things that I can do in a pipeline. Simple things initially. Now this, is, this shows my absolute 
uh, unfamiliarity with Python because I pulled in a Java example to show you. Sorry, that's limitation in my background. Um, here's an example of where I created a stage, named it document. And this, again, goes back to the fact I can name them whatever I want to, put them in whatever order. Uh, you know, there are my steps. One of the steps I have is to set the working directory, you know, where I expect to find um, the stuff I'm going to build, for instance. Once I've done that, I actually have a step where I can say to run this with a particular Maven configuration, and I can put in a few parameters to define what that configuration ought to look like, and then I go ahead and I run a shell step to go ahead and execute Maven and do whatever uh, goal or phase that I want to do in my Maven build. So this quick example of how we could build, say, a uh, documentation stage into our overall pipeline. Very simple kind of thing. Um, remember how I mentioned that we had, while we, you know, we didn't necessarily have control over the ordering of the stages except in terms of how we put them into the script, but we do have some control over, for instance, whether they run or not. So here's a stage called analyze where I don't really want to do this unless the build has been stable up to this point. So I can put in a when block inside my stage and have an expression that's going to check the current build status and say, okay, if you're, you know, I'm going to execute this stage when the build is stable. Jenkins is smart enough to figure out, well, if the build isn't stable at this point, I skip all the steps in that stage. I skip the, the stage entirely, right? So rather than my having to code in some kind of an if statement around my stage, within the definition of my stage, I put the when block, I've got a gate condition as to whether or not the stage executes. I have a similar kind of thing that I can do at the end of the builds, and this is outside of the stages section. This is a separate section on its own toward the end of the pipeline where I can define things that should occur after the build completes, right? So I don't have to ha put in a bunch of if logic all over the place to figure out, okay, when is the build going to complete? Because there are a variety of different ways it come to, could come to completion, either as stable, unstable, or failed, right? This is going to make sure that regardless of how I exit the build, certain things are going to happen. And in this case, I have a block that says what to do in case this is unstable. I could have a separate block for failed, a separate block for succeeded. I could do different things in each of those cases if I chose to. Very simple way, and you know, it's nice for Jenkins to do all the heavy lifting for me to say, okay, well, I know that the build's done. Let me run these steps. Uh, sorry. Yep. I already explained all that. Never mind. All right. Now, this is the one that I mentioned earlier when I talked about how we have you know, control over where the build runs. And I, you know, my initial example was I said agent any, right? So any available node, go ahead and run it there. Um, and I talked about how we could actually do things like say, well, only run it on things that have a certain label. Like for instance, you may have a label that defines, hey, um, these, these particular nodes have Mac OS, and if I want to do an iOS build, of some kind, I want to run on the Mac OS nodes, not try to run it on a Windows node and have it blow up out from underneath me. So that's one of the things I can do with an agent. But this is even more interesting. This is one where I can take a particular uh, Docker container definition and dynamically create a node based on that container definition to run my build. So I basically say, hey, use that image. With those args, set up a, a new Docker instance for me, run the build. Yes? So the question was, was where does it, in essence, where does it run? The, does it do it on the Jenkins node? Notice down at the bottom where it says no example. That's because I haven't really tested this out yet. So I don't really know the answer to your question. I haven't really played around with this functionality. Um, if you send me your contact information, I will be glad to research that and get you an answer. Sorry about that. But yeah, I think there is somewhere in the uh, Jenkins config overall configuration, I think, where you define where essentially the Docker server is that you're dealing with. So I think, I think that's the answer to it, but I, I'm not real comfortable with that. Okay, so yeah, we talked about dynamically provisioning. 
All right, so those are some of the you know, cool things you can do, but I mean, in the end, it all boils down to those steps that we saw on the stages, right? If I'm gonna write a meaningful pipeline, I've gotta have some meaningful steps that I can execute. So what kinds of steps can I take? Well, the good news is that I'm not limited to things that Docker itself has defined. Steps can de be and are defined in plugins. And there have been a bunch of plugins that have been updated to reflect, to support pipeline. And just to give you an example, and I'm not going to uh, expect you to read through all of these, nor am I going to try to uh, describe them all, but just to give you the flavor of what we're dealing with, a whole bunch, and they do all kinds of different things. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do in your steps. But what do you do when your existing steps aren't enough? Right? There's something you want to do that there's no plug-in for, or you want to do it a slightly different way. Well, there are a variety of things you can do, but probably the most interesting thing to look at is for you to actually write your own script to do the thing that you want to do. And you'll notice that in our pipeline here, we actually have a step called script whose body then is a groovy script that's going to get executed. Fairly simple stuff here. I'm gonna say hip hip array three times. Well, you know, no big deal. Thing of it is, while this gives you a lot of power, we need to keep in mind that being good coders, we wanna make sure, sorry, skip that. We wanna make sure we follow the dry principle. And I'm, I'm assuming that people at a Python conference know what dry means, but just in case you don't, don't repeat yourself. In other words, if you think about this, and going back to one of our earlier questions, well, you know, can I build like multiple repositories all through one Jenkins file? Well, the answer is really, well, I have Jenkins files in each repository, which means I potentially have lots of Jenkins files to deal with. And if I inline my code, I've got lots of different places that I'm potentially maintaining that code. And even if it's really great code and does really cool things, that's a really bad idea. Well, the people that uh, produced Jenkins were smart enough to know that, so they gave us shared script libraries. And shared script libraries are pretty easy to use. The first thing to realize is that your shared script library is just like everything else that Jenkins deals with as code in some way, whether it's your application code or it's the Jenkins file itself. In other words, it needs to be out in source control somewhere, right? So here we've, I've actually created a uh, scripts repository in the same uh, uh, GitHub organization. It wouldn't have to be there. It could be anywhere else I wanted to put it. But a couple of things to notice about this. First of all, things like, okay, I've got a branch name of 1.0. Why would I create a branch name of 1.0? Well, like any other code, it's quite likely that I may need to use different versions of this library. The way that Jenkins is going to deal with those versions is through the branches I define in source control. Right? The other thing to be aware of is that there is a standard structure that Jenkins is expecting to find in this repository. Now, it's a fairly simple kind of thing. Uh, first of all, I've got a uh, folder called resources that can be used for non-groovy files. Let's say I have a data file that one of the scripts relies on. That's where I'd put it. If I define groovy classes, so something that follows like a, a Java package structure kind of thing, it's an actual class, it would go in the source folder. However, if I wanted to have some kind of a global script, I'd put it in the vars folder. And for the most part, that's what I've found to be the most useful. Not to say that you don't occasionally create you know, groovy classes that you might use, but a lot of the work that you would expect to do and a script library is probably going to be in some kind of a global script. And so you're probably going to put it in the vars folder. Now, just creating this isn't quite enough. Jenkins has to know about this. It has to know where to find your scripts. So we have this configuration that we would do, and there are a couple of different levels at which I could put this. I can do this globally, or I can do it at a folder level. Now, we haven't really talked about folders, but you've sort of seen one implicitly. And that is that you know, when we created our pipeline and we said, I want it for the Pi Ohio Jenkins organization, and I picked a repository, all that kind of thing, Jenkins actually went ahead and created a folder for me called Pi Ohio Jenkins. So that all of the 
builds related to the repositories in that GitHub organization will appear in that folder. I can go and do this kind of a configuration, <clears throat> excuse me, at that level, so that I could maybe say have uh, one set of shared script libraries for one group of projects and a different set of libraries for, you know, a lot of flexibility there, in other words. Now, I have to give my library a name, and we'll see why that's important here in a minute. I also probably, it's up to me, but I can define a default version. And that goes back to what we just talked about in terms of that branch within source control. And this is what gets used. If I don't anywhere in my code say which version of the library to use, this is the one that's going to get used. And then kind of the most important thing is I've got to tell it where in source control to find stuff, right? So I'm gonna say, okay, GitHub and, and what uh, organization, and in the end, what repository am I actually going to find my script code in? All right, so now that I've got all this set up, I wanna use my, my library. Well, let's look at my Jenkins file where I'm going to use the library. First thing to note is I have this annotation up here where I reference the shared library by name. So when we said we had to give a name to our library, this is where it gets used in the at library annotation. Now, I don't necessarily have to do the next thing, but it's probably not bad practice to do so, and that's to actually call out which script I'm going, or scripts I'm going to use through import statements. That helps to clarify in my Jenkins file exactly which scripts I'm depending on and so on. And then down here, I'm actually calling my script as a step, right? So I'm within my stage and my steps section, and then I have a step that's calling a script. So what does that script look like? Well, remember how we said that we had the var folder out in our, you know, out in source control where we were going to put our global scripts? So I have a file called threecheers.groovy in var to match what I, you know, my script was named three cheers. Okay, so that makes sense. Now, probably the most important thing to notice here is that I have in here a method that I've called, that I've named call. And if you want to be able to use the script as a step, you have to name the method that. Now, keep in mind, it can have lots of different signatures, and we'll see that here in a second, but it's gotta be named call. And then I can have groovy code to do pretty much whatever the heck I want to do. Yeah. Um, the question was, are there any restrictions and examples given were um, calling URL, posting out to the, or shelling out to the, uh, the sorry, out to the, sh out to the shell. The answer is, you can do all of those things that you mentioned. There probably are some restrictions um, and they tend to relate to if you were to try to do some uh, things that touch the pipeline, it, you know, things that were like, you tried to put, say, declarative script in here, it's not gonna work. If you were to try to put a, a stage in here, which you can do in scripted pipeline, but if you tried to do it here, it's not gonna work. So there are some things that aren't going to work, and there may be some other restrictions that I'm not aware of, but in general, you can do kind of all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so that was a simple one. Let's look at something a little more advanced. Uh, again, we see our at library, our import, uh, but down here we see we're calling a, our repeat message script, which we defined in our import, but we're calling it with parameters. Okay, so how did, given that our call method was just call no parameters, how do we do that? Well, in this case, we've got our repeat message groovy right where we expect it to be. We have our call method, but as I said, the signature can be whatever we want it to be. So we go out there and we define whatever parameters we expect to take in, and then we use them wherever we want to use them. So you know, I use times in my you know to control my loop. I use message as the string that I'm going to echo. Right. So a lot of flexibility there, but it gets better. Suppose I want to do something that looks like this. Notice here's my script called repeat. Notice I'm passing a parameter to repeat. But the thing that gets repeated is actually a code block. How do I do that? Since I know I'm calling out to a script, right? Got a code block I want to execute. How in the world do I pass that? Well, the good news is, 
that Groovy provides me a type called closure that represents a code block. So I define a code block parameter of type closure on my call method. And then I just say body, and it executes whatever that code block is. A lot of flexibility. Right? Cool stuff that's going on here. Uh, I would like to show you some of the things that you can do uh, if you have really large kind of Jenkins installations where you have a lot of projects going on, uh, dealing with pipelines at scale, and some of that used um, scripted pipeline instead of declarative pipeline. I worked that into the other presentation I did, but I had half an hour more to deal with things. So sorry I can't show you all of that today. I will, as I mentioned, uh, provide you the URL to where that presentation is so that if you're interested, you can go look at that. Um, but what I can do in the time that we have remaining is look very quickly at something that's called multi-branch support. And this is another one of those aspects in which if you let Jenkins do what it wants to do, you get some really cool things that it handles for you. So let's go back to my example, my hello world thing. And yeah, it's great that I had my master branch, but in real life, you know, if people are using Git or GitHub, they're going to be creating branches all over the place. And I probably don't want to go in every time the developers create a new branch and have to change Jenkins to build that branch for them. That would just be painful. Right? So I've got my new branch called PyOhio sitting out there. What do I have to do to get Jenkins to build that? And the short answer is nothing. Now notice that in my, you know, my pipeline, PyOhio Jenkins slash hello, I've got a branches view out there. And notice also that it automatically picked up and built my PyOhio branch for me. Now you might ask, well, how did it do that? Well, what it does is it goes out and it scans source control, looking or is it using webhooks? Um, it can use webhooks for the, to be notified of a commit, but I'm pretty sure it needs to pull or for the scanning that it's doing to look for new branches. Um, and just that's from having viewed the logs that are involved. Now, to some degree, that may be a limitation of the environment that we've set up because of how we're set up. There's no easy way to do webhooks into our Jenkins. So we don't have that configured, so I, I don't want to get too adamant about that. But what I've seen is it goes out and it pulls. And for GitHub, that can actually be an issue because you have uh, quotas for API calls. Yeah, exactly. And so that could, you know, you may actually get into situations where, in essence, your scanning gets paused until you know, you, your quota refreshes. So, yeah, that can be a bit of an issue. Uh, there's another question, yeah. So the question was, what happens if the Jenkins file changes on the PyOhio branch? And the answer is, it's really just like any other code change. So it will recognize that as a commit that gets done to that branch, that which will trigger a build on that branch. And whatever the latest, you know, we saw in the console output, first thing it does is it checks out the PyOhio, I mean the Jenkins file, sorry, uh, out of source control. It would do that. It would pick up whatever the current configuration of the Jenkins file is, and it would run that. You know, so for that branch, whatever, and so you actually could have, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but you could have different Jenkins files in each branch, different contents in your Jenkins file in each branch. Now, obviously, you know, you expect that to converge, right? You're not, you're not really going to go on with that over a long period of time, just as you, know, as you would merge any other code changes in, you would expect to merge your Jenkins file code change in. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have a lot of flexibility there in terms of what happens. Good news is this was all for free. Now, uh, if you remember back when we defined the pipeline, we actually had the option to say, scan the, or the GitHub organization for any repository that has a Jenkins file. Combine those two features, that ability to scan for any repository and the ability to automatically recognize new branches. You have some pretty hands-off kind of stuff that you can do that as, you, you know, as your code base grows, there's a lot that Jenkins will do for you, so you're minimizing 
the amount of administration you have to do. Now, keep in mind, this is all in blue ocean. Blue ocean's taking the rosy view of the world. If, for instance, there were certain branches that I didn't want to build for whatever reason, I could go in in the standard UI, the standard Jenkins UI, go in and put in regular expressions to limit which branches get built and all, all kinds of cool stuff like that. But from a blue ocean perspective, it, it's expecting to build everything that you can find. I had the five minute notification about two minutes ago, so I am going to ask if there are any other questions. Sure. Right. Right. So the question was about kind of comparing the Jenkins 1.0 way of doing things with, with this approach and, and sort of what the main benefits are. Um, yes, I mean, to some degree it's that, yeah, hey, it's going to go find it for you. But in the long run, it's that ability to kind of exist within that pipeline metaphor, right? That you want something that's going to exist in source control, not, not externally that's going to define your build for you because that becomes every bit as much a part of your configuration as your code does or your infrastructure as a code or whatever else, right? And very often we used to have that problem that if we, you know, let's say we were going to try to take a build and put it on somebody else's environment, well, I had to go figure out how do I export the Jenkins configuration, take that over, import it in. This is now out in source control. It's a part of my application. Right. Everything that happens is right there. So that simplifies a lot for us and, and helps us stick to our standards a lot better. I think we have time for one more question real quick. Yeah, whoever had it. So the question was, how does Jenkins Pipeline as code compare to uh, some other tools that have a similar concept? Sorry, I haven't had experience with those, so I really don't have a, a good understanding of how those compare. And since we are probably down to uh, last second here, if you do have more questions, feel free to catch up with me. Uh, my contact information was out there earlier. You may well have forgotten that. The thing not to forget is that URL up there, the Pi Ohio Jenkins GitHub organization, that has all of the examples that we went through. I will take this presentation and put it out there as well. There will be a resources uh, repository out there by end of day tomorrow uh, that will have this presentation as well as those other links and the link to the presentation I did back in May where there's some information about using uh, Jenkins Pipeline as code at scale. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate uh, you guys sitting through this this late on a Sunday. Hopefully this is helpful to you. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Sure.